You'd, you'd really like one embarrassing story, wouldn't you, huh, John? I will, I will spare you that, because he has more on me from his parents than I have on him. So I'm not going to get that started. It really is good to be great. It, it's, it's great to be with you this morning, and it's great to be in Wisconsin. And I still live in Wisconsin, but lately when people ask me uh, where I live, I've been telling them Southwest Airlines. Um, <laughs> because I've been traveling a lot. It's, it's good to be back also in Madison. We used to come here often to visit our daughter who was going to school here. And uh, we have such fond memories of Madison in, in so many ways. But more than any of that, it's just good to look out at faces who take very seriously the call of Jesus to be a part of building the kingdom. And I don't know what yeses you have quietly said in your own heart, in prayer, and in obedience, but heaven takes note of these things. And today we get to celebrate all those yeses that we have been giving collectively to the Lord Jesus. And then we can pray that he would fan those into a flame, that somehow we might impact this world even more for the glory of Jesus till he comes. So I want to spend some time with you this morning, actually on a topic that is different than the one that I initially planned on talking about. I was um, visiting with John a few months ago and and I had a talk that I was anxious to give and to work through, but last week I wrote to John and, and said, uh, John, we've got um, a fire going on in the world right now. In fact, the world itself seems like it's on fire. And God is calling those who love him to run to the world on fire when most people understand we want to run from it. And one of those fires right now is this global refugee crisis. Now, working with refugees is not new for World Relief. We've been doing it for nearly 40 years. We've, we have, by the grace of God, we settled about 300,000 refugees over that time in 26 different um, cities over the country. And for us, this is personal. This isn't about some new policy. This isn't about reacting to something that just happened. This is about the names and faces and lives of people we've come to know over generations that we've gotten to know sitting over a cup of coffee at a kitchen table or on a living room floor. Often those stories are told through tears. So when John and I talked about this global refugee crisis, it seemed like it might be helpful to talk about it a bit, a bit today because many of you are in churches where people are conflicted. How should I feel about this crisis? How do I, on one hand, embrace the call of Jesus to serve the vulnerable, on the other hand, live in a country that is worried about its security? How do I hold those together? And my guess is you have some of those questions in your own heart and you're getting them at your churches. My goal today is in a very brief time to give you a bit of a survey. And that's all I can do because we could spend hours and hours digging through the scripture or telling the stories or talking about policies. And so all I can do in this short time is spend a survey or take a survey with you on some of those themes. But I want to start first asking you to indulge me a little bit about my own story and how this comes alive for me. And I think the first thing I would tell you is that for me, this issue had to become biblical before it was political or economic. And in our world right now, that's getting turned upside down. Most of how people are looking at the refugee crisis is through a political lens and an economic lens. We have to flip that and say, how do we look at it biblically and how do we look at it humanly? Now, when I take a look at Jesus dealing with the vulnerable and I grapple with the scriptures, it's hard for me to get away from, to escape the fact that Jesus turns everything on its head. If you think, for example, about the reality that Jesus and almost all of his encounters with those who are poor and suffering in the scriptures, what he tends to do is take those who are on the margins of the picture and he moves them into the center. And those who are in the center of the picture, he moves them to the margins. Think for a moment about Luke chapter eight, when we have this woman who has this medical issue for 12 years, she's been bleeding, she spent all her money going to every doctor she could and she's no better, she's only poor desperate for help, she joins a crowd pressing around Jesus. And in the middle of that crowd, she's reaching through, sticking her hand to try to touch Jesus. And Jesus stops his disciples and says, who touched me? And they very reasonably said, Jesus, what are you talking about who touched you? We can hardly move in this crowd. We can hardly breathe in this crowd. And you're asking who touched you? And Jesus says this, he said, I felt power go out from me. Because of all the people that were touching, 
He felt the vulnerable one. He felt the desperate one. And Jesus turns and he says something to her. He heals her. And we, we've learned to expect that from Jesus. But he did more than that. He said something to her that he didn't say to anybody else in Scripture. He called her daughter. Not only did he heal her body, he healed her dignity. Because of her infirmity, she would have been considered unclean. She would have been outside of the synagogue. She would have been outside the fellowship. Nobody was going to associate with her. She was on the margins, and Jesus took her and put her right in the center of the picture. It's because that's what Jesus does. But if we go to Luke 18, we get this picture of the Pharisee and the tax collector going into the synagogue going into the temple to pray, and the Pharisee, the religious one, the one who has all the favor, says to God, oh God, I thank you that you didn't make me a sinner like this man. And the tax collector has a completely different reaction. He's beating his chest saying, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, who do you think went away justified? And what Jesus does though one more time is he takes someone who's at the center and he pushes them to the margins. And what we have to recognize is Jesus said something very profound over and over. He said this. He said, the first, they're going to be last. And the last, they're going to be first. And we have to let that disrupt us. It has to break through. Because here's a danger that you and I have living in the nation that we live in with the security and the resources I don't know what your income is, but I can tell you that compared to most of the world that we at World Relief work in, you are extraordinarily rich. I just came back from Rwanda and Burundi where four and six children out of 10 respectively are so undernourished, they're stunted, they will never be able to recover the cognitive ability no matter how much food is given to them later. They've been stunted. The injustice of this. So we live in a world where we might believe we have favored status. We must be God's favor, favorites. Look at what we have. But the reality is God does have a favored status and we don't have it. If you look in the scriptures, you will find that God loves, leans towards, seeks out the vulnerable and the suffering. In particular, the triad of the vulnerable, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. And over and over, God says, do not lose sight of these because I will not. And in fact, if you look in the Hebrew scriptures, God's command to care for the stranger, the alien, the foreigner is mentioned second only to his command to worship the one true God. That's how seriously God takes this. And we have to take it more seriously. And we have to take it more seriously because the scripture calls it to us and the God that we worship says it matters to him. That's biblical, but it's also personal. <clears throat> I remember one time being in the refugee resettlement office in, our, in Chicago, and I was standing across from a young man from Myanmar. You might know it as Burma. He was volunteering there. And I have fallen in love with World Relief many times, but it's these kinds of encounters that makes me fall in love with her over and over again. And I asked him, why are you volunteering at this refugee resettlement office? And he said, you have to understand, I was a refugee in my country for 17 years. And by the way, 17 years is exactly the average tenure in a refugee camp. It's not 17 weeks, it's not 17 months, it's 17 years years. And he said, I was a refugee there since I was a young boy. I grew up in that refugee camp, never thought I would leave. I met my wife, we married, we had a child, and I thought I would spend the rest of my life here. But then against all odds, it seemed, we were told that we would be giving refugee status to the U.S., and we didn't know if we were happy or not because we, we were so frightened to stay where we were, but we were frightened to go to a place we didn't know. And he said, someone came up in the camp and gave me a crumpled $20 U.S. bill and said, you may need this. He said, I put it in my pocket and my wife and my child and I, we began our travel to the U.S. not knowing what to expect. 
and we started getting on airplanes and going through airports, and not once in that entire time did we do anything but drink water because all we had was this 20. We didn't know what we would find. We felt so vulnerable. He says, you don't know what it felt like when we landed at O'Hare and we came out of customs and there was a group of people there with a sign with my name on it. And these people took me out to the parking lot where there was a group of people from the church that was welcoming me and they had someone from my country who could speak my language. And they took me to the apartment that they had secured for me, full of the furniture that they had bought to put in and a refrigerator full of food so that we would not go hungry. And they sat us down and they told us about how they already had somebody out looking for a job for me so that I could take care of my own family, that they were going to sign us up if we wanted for English as a second language class. And if we wanted, we would be welcome to join this community of these people that they called Christians. He said, you have no idea to have what it was like to have been so frightened and feel so embraced. This is the work of the gospel. And it has to be biblical and it has to be human before it becomes political and economic. I want to talk a little bit about just what it is that we're experiencing. And my computer has switched slides, but this is not. I could turn this for you. (laughs) I may have to. I think we're getting help. Let me continue on as I deal with that. In the generation that you and I live in, we are witness to unprecedented levels of suffering and displacements of people. Different generations have experienced different things. You're in my generation, this generation, we are seeing the displacement and suffering of more people than has ever been known in the history of the world. It's on our watch. And I'm going to show you just how many that is, if I can get to it. Oh, we're not getting there. Do you want this or? I want to honor your time, so I'm going to keep going. And I'm sorry that you're not going to see the slides on this. Maybe you will in a bit. I want to distinguish first between a refugee and an immigrant, two critically important groups of people. But when I'm talking about refugees, it's actually a different group of people than you're hearing about in much of the news as of just late when we're talking about border security. You see, immigrants are those who come into the country largely by choice, coming in from southern borders or northern borders, or they might come in on a work visa and overstay that work visa. There are many, many immigrants who come. Some are documented, some are not. A critically important group of people. We work with that group of people, love that group of people. But what I'm talking about this morning are refugees. And here's the difference. Refugees can only come to the U.S. if they're invited to come. They cannot choose to come to the U.S., The only way a refugee can come to the U.S. is if the U.S. State Department invites them to come. And only if the U.S. State Department, after inviting them to come, spends 18 to 24 months vetting them to make sure they're not a danger. So we're talking about a different group of people here. Now, if we talk broadly, however, about displaced peoples, right now there are 65 million displaced people in the world up 6 million from just last year, 65 million. Let me give you a picture of how many that is. I want you to imagine that you're driving home after this conference, and every home you drive by is empty. Every apartment complex, every condominium, the streets are empty, the shops are closed, everybody is gone. But not just in Madison or Milwaukee, or La Crosse, or Stevens Point, or Eau Claire, the entire state. But then I want you to picture that that's also true in Chicago, and all of Illinois, and Indianapolis, and all of Indiana, and Minneapolis, and all of Minnesota, and Detroit, and all of Michigan. You can take the 12 Midwestern states and imagine every single home being empty, and then you get a picture for what is happening in the world right now, 65 million displaced people 
who have been bombed out. They are running from torture or rape. They are running from persecution. They are running from places that you and I would never imagine living, and they didn't imagine living themselves. Of that 65 million, 21.3 million are refugees, and the difference between the displaced and refugees, displaced people may be displaced in their own country. The refugees have been forced out of their country. That's 35,000 people a day. 35,000 today, 35,000 tomorrow, and the next day, and every day. Every family disrupted, on the run, hungry, cold, unwanted, likely grieving because they have lost someone that is dear to them. This is the population among the most vulnerable in the world. People who once thought they had stability and peace and security, much like you and I think, they would have never believed that this could happen to them, and it has. I want you to look for a moment. This is the Midwestern um, states that represent the 65 million, and I'm actually going the wrong way. I want you to take a look at home Syria for a moment. This is the experience of these people. Take a look at the picture on the left of homes in 2011 and the picture on the right. That's what has happened in their homes. And Christians are being killed in dramatic numbers. The Middle East church is facing extinction. The reality is that the population of the Middle East a century ago was 20% Christian. It is now 4% Christian. And the State Department has rightly said that in many places in the Middle East, there is genocide against Christians. But you and I can't forget as much as we care about those brothers and sisters being brutalized, we cannot forget that many others of other faiths are also being brutalized, and some who declare no faith at all. It is human suffering at the extreme, and these people are also made in the image of God. They are also objects of his love, and we cannot forget about them. What's it like to live in these places? I want to read you a statement from an observer that was on the ground and he said this, let me take you to East Aleppo this afternoon. In a deep basement, huddled with children and elderly parents, the stench of urine and the vomit caused by unrelieved fear never leaves your nostrils. As you wait for the bunker-busting bomb you know may kill you in this, the only sanctuary left to you. But just like the one that took your neighbor in their house out last night, Imagine scrabbling with your bare hands in the street above to reach under concrete rubble, lethal steel reinforcing bars jutting as you as you hysterically try to reach your young child screaming unseen in the dust and dirt below your feet, choking to catch your breath in the toxic dust and the smell of gas ever ready to ignite and explore, explode over you. These people are just like you and me, not sitting around a table in New York, but forced into desperate, pitiless suffering, their future wiped out. These are the constant, harrowing reports and images of people detained, tortured, forcibly displaced, maimed and executed. Bombings take place in plain sight, night and day, day in and day out. Hospitals are destroyed, doctors killed, schools destroyed, futures ended. So here's the question. In this day that we witness this incredible suffering, in this day when we live in what is arguably the most wealthy, well-resourced, well-educated group of Christians ever to live on the face of the earth, what will the church do in this day? What will you and I do in this day? There are many organizations trying to reach into this. My stories come out of the organization that I'm a part of in World Relief. And our mission, very simply, is to empower the church to serve the most vulnerable. We, we have done that over the years in about 110 different countries. By the grace of God, we served 7 million people last year. And we do it through the churches because God has chosen the church as his agency to express the justice and the holiness and the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. And our goal is to empower the church to do that. We're not looking for anybody to wear our World Relief t-shirts. It doesn't matter. We want them looking to the church and we want them looking to Jesus. And so we get to do that in the different places in the world. 
I want to tell you something about how, by the grace of God, the church is expressing itself right in the Middle East. And so if we could cue up that video. We talked about 65 million and 21 million and 35,000 a day, but these are faces and names of people loved by God himself made in his image and objects of his love and we're trying to reach into that. Imagine as a parent, you were having to flee your hometown, running from the prospects of torture or of being killed by bombs. You have probably lost someone, you're running for your life and you are struggling with everything you believe and all of a sudden there's this group of people at the church who are reaching out to you and saying, because you're made in the image of God, because you have human dignity, but they also then begin to express the love and the grace of Jesus. And so at World Relief, what we're trying to do right now is work within five different countries in the Middle East. And we're working to try to bring many of the basic needs, whether it be food or water or shelter, but again, through the churches. We're also trying to work in terms of uh, trauma care because so many people are traumatized. We're working with them in the uh, areas of safe spaces for children, giving children a place once again to play and to be children and to do so with children from other countries. We're doing peace building work, trying to establish the notion that God is a God of peace and giving them access to education. And imagine as a parent, you see someone doing that for your children. It makes you begin to ask questions. Who are these people and who is this Jesus that they worship? But we offer this regardless of their faith or how they respond to our faith, we do it because they're vulnerable and they need it. Now I wanna turn for a few minutes to the US because there's a large question about just who is it that's coming to the US? Well, in the refugee population that is selected by the State Department to come, it is 70% women and children. In fact, 70% the same number, 70% of the people that World Relief resettles are family reunifications. These are families that have been separated for years by war and by terror. And they, they are of all faiths. Some have argued that Christians have been marginalized in this. That's not been our experience. People I respect have said that. In our experience, for example, in the country of Burma, it's only 5% Christian, but 70% of the refugees that are resettled are Christian because they are the ones who are most vulnerable. But we resettle without regard to the faith, but the government chooses who will come. I wanna show you a little bit about the basic populations that would come. Um, not sure how I got there. Um, you'll see Burma is a very significant source of refugees, as is Iraq and Somalia, Ukraine, Bhutan. We think only in terms of Syria and the Middle East, the refugee flow over the years has been from many, many countries because terror and war is great in many countries. Democratic Republic of Congo, it's been a civil war for over 10 years, more than five million people have been killed. So it is not just in the Middle East, it's also in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's in the Far East. The question that many people would rightly ask, so what about safety, what about security? Can we really, afford to bring these people into the country. And one of the things that we need to recognize again is that World Relief or any of the other resettlement agencies, we don't pick the refugees to come. We don't choose them, we don't vet them. The only time we see anything of a refugee is first when the State Department says, we have gone in and following the selection process of the UN, we have then further selected the pool of people we're interested in, and, they, and we have vetted them with the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI through multiple scans, multiple interviews, biometric scans, fingerprinting, and only then do they allow them into the country. We first get contact with that refugee only when that file has been put in front of us. So we have to recognize that when we're talking about the refugee population being so dangerous, They've actually gone through these 11 steps, and I know that's entirely unreadable, but I'll reference a book later that you can look to if you wanna see it. But the vetting process is not only stringent, people have called it ineffective and porous. Well, let's take a look at the effectiveness. Since 1980, we have resettled three million refugees in this country. Not a single American life has been lost to a refugee through an act of terror. 
And you might say, well, but what about since 9-11? Since 9-11, we have resettled 800,000 refugees in this country, and not a single American life has been taken through an act of terror by a refugee. The Cato Institute, a libertarian institute, estimates that your and my risk as a U.S. citizen of being killed by a refugee is one in 3.64 billion. That's about the likelihood that on your way home tonight, you're going to get both hit by lightning and win the lottery. <laughs> and yet, what we are doing is we are saying this group of people is so dangerous, we must completely shut our borders for four months. Then we must reduce the flow from 100,000 down to 50,000, or 110,000 to 50,000. Why? Because they're so dangerous. But the reason the courts have blocked the executive order is because there's no demonstrable proof that this population is dangerous. Now, I want to be very clear about what I'm not saying. We live in a dangerous world, and we should take security very seriously. And there are refugees who have been involved in um, three cases that we're aware of that took no one's life, but had they matured, they could have. It could happen. But what I'm saying is that we have somehow believed that comp uh, compassion and security are mutually exclusive in this country. We don't live any other part of our lives that way. 10,000 Americans will be killed by drunk drivers this year. One million people will self-report to have driving either drunk or under the influence of drugs, and yet you and I will get in our cars and go home. 162,000 people will die of choking this year, but we'll eat our lunch. You have a better chance of getting killed by a refugee, or a better chance of dying by a stray golf ball than being killed by a refugee. All I'm saying is that we need to be cautious. We have volunteered to work with the Trump administration on this notion of safety and compassion, both being held in high values. We just don't believe that we've rightly weighed the real risk that's here. The risk has been overstated, and these people are vulnerable. And what about the numbers? Right now, our commitment as a U.S., as a nation, is two-tenths of one percent of the world's refugees. People are worried that we're bringing in so many refugees, we're going to overrun the culture. Two-tenths of one percent. And I want to draw this to a close with regard to the church. The refugee population is in so many ways a gift that God has given to the church to allow us to express the calling of Matthew 25. You know that passage. Let me read it for you briefly, where Jesus says this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne. And all the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink, a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me, ill and you cared for me in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. Jesus is at our doorstep. And you know that he goes on to say, and whatsoever you did not do for one of the least of these, that you did not do for me. This is a moment when God is allowing the church to live out Matthew 25, in the most extraordinary refugee crisis the world has known, the church has a chance to step in and to act. And one of the questions for us as believers, I who celebrate Jesus, am I willing to give up one part in 3.64 billion of my security to make room for the unwanted, the suffering, and the vulnerable. It's also a chance for us to live out Matthew 28, our great calling of the Great Commission, to live out a seamless, integrated gospel in word and in deed. 
And there are many who we celebrate when our missionaries go to the far corners of the world to preach the gospel, to live the gospel. And now God has chosen in this season to bring some to this nation. Do we pull up the welcome mat? Do we slam the door or do we say, no, we're going to welcome? Wisely, faithfully, but we're going to welcome them. And it's also in time when, in fact, it enriches the church. The reality is, is that the refugee population and the immigrant population makes the American church come alive because they bring fresh faith. They bring a love for Jesus. They bring a vibrancy that we have too easily lost. We have too often gone cold in our faith. And God is wanting to reignite the Western church by the faith of the refugee and the immigrant, and we're sending them away. You remember what Jesus did when he became, he who was rich became poor, so we in turn might become rich? Paul talks about this way in the book of Philippians. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Take on the attitude of Jesus, that even though he was a son of God, he did not use it for his own advantage. Instead, he threw off his securities and he humbled himself even to become a servant, even to the point of death. If Jesus lived a life that was consumed by self-protection, there would have been no manger, there would have been no cross, there would have been no resurrection, and you and I would be dead in our sins. We have a calling. It's to justice. It's to compassion. It's to mercy. We do not set government policy on refugees, but we're using our voice for, on behalf of those who have no voice and saying we can hold compassion and security together. I was asked, is it unpatriotic? And my answer was, we've been told that we should become great again. Can America be so great that she can be both the most compassionate and the most secure. I believe we're capable of it. And I believe the church can be at the center of this calling. Amen? Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would stir up in us a measure of your love for these vulnerable, suffering ones. Do not, please, Lord Jesus, do not let them become for us nameless, faceless numbers. Let them not become for us political ping-pongs. Let them become for us the beloved of God who you are pursuing. Stir up our imagination on how we can be involved and how we can be the witness of Christ Jesus to this generation of people for the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.